In the previous video, we already spoke about the need for standardization in the context of networks. One of the most important efforts to standardize networks was a project that was undertaken by the International Standards Organization, or the ISO. The ISO wanted one to be able to connect systems from various vendors, and therefore they called their standard an open standard. Specifically, they referred to the standard as the Open Systems Interconnection Model, the OSI model. For many years, people believed that one day we would have systems that were ISO compliant, ISO OSI compliant to be more specific. And these networks then would be able to interconnect, talk to one another without any problems. In the 1980s, if one went to a network conference, even into the 1990s, one would hear that people were saying, yes, we have the networks that we have today, but one day we will have ISO OSI compliant networks. That never happened. No network was ever built that was ISO OSI compliant. So you should rightfully ask, why are we then discussing it? And the reason is that it forms a very good reference standard. It's a standard that is known throughout the networking community and whoever works in the network community will very often use ISO OSI terminology to refer to aspects of networking. As you will soon enough discover, the ISO OSI standard consists of seven layers and what you will find is that people who are working with a network that doesn't even have seven layers may talk about layer 7 functionality and everybody will know what they mean because they are talking about ISO OSI layer 7. One of the critical things for you as a student in this field is to learn the names of the various layers because when we talk about these layers we will very often use the name of the layer and the number of the layer interchangeably. So if I were to say network layer and someone else would say layer 3, that's the same thing. If someone were to talk about layer 7, someone else about the application layer, that's the same thing. So uh, without thinking about it, without taking time to translate from a name to a number, that should come automatically. You shouldn't even hesitate to move from one to the other. So one of the critical tasks, uh, if you want to follow what f follows in this series of videos, is to learn these names and layer numbers by heart. Let's delve into the standard so that we can explain how it works. <laughs> If one wants to interconnect two computers, then the logical place to begin is to establish some sort of a link between them, some sort of a, what we will call a physical link. So if that is our one computer and that is our other computer, then we will somehow connect them. And that may be by copper, it may be by optical fiber, it may even be by radio waves uh, going through the air, doesn't matter. And in our model, which we've already said will be a seven layer model, this bottommost connection is layer one. And layer one is known as the physical layer. On that physical layer, you will get all sorts of electrical signals, if it's copper, or all sorts of light signals, if it's optical fiber, or radio waves, and so on. But somehow you need to make sense of all of that. Uh, the message that is sent from one end to the other end begins somewhere, and ends somewhere. And as you will soon enough learn, we're going to send these as packets. So every packet needs to be marked. This is the beginning and this is the end and so on. So on top of this physical connection, we build layer two that is known as the data link layer. 
This is the layer that will control what is seen. It will make sense of what is seen on layer one. So on layer two, we will have a layer two on our one computer. So layer two software, we often firmware. And logically, every layer talks to its peer layer. Peer layer on the same le level as it is. So logically, this layer two talks to layer two at the destination machine. But physically, the real way that the signal is transmitted is the signal will be passed down. So whatever layer two does, so whatever layer two does is it will put its message uh, content uh, at it and then transmit it down one layer where it will traverse the physical path and then at the destination it will go upwards to layer two. So logical peer-to-peer -peer, physical down to layer one via the actual connection and then at the destination up to the peer again. This layer, as we said, is the data link layer. Uh, one word, two words. Uh, I think I'll probably uh, usually write it as two words. I know it's not uh, entirely clear what I've done there, but two words uh, is what I will typically do. Layer three is an interesting layer. What we've done thus far is we've enabled two machines that are directly connected to communicate. That's somewhat boring. What we need to achieve in the end is to be able to send a message right around the world without running cable right around the world. So we're going to send it from one machine to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. So um, this machine that we've been talking about here may actually have a second network interface card installed. And what we've been talking about here as layer one is actually that network interface card in the machine. So if we install a second network interface card in this very same machine, then this machine may be connected to a third machine. And suppose we used uh, copper there then on this link from the second card from this machine, we, we may use fiber. And just like we previously had a layer two, whatever is put on this fiber link will also be managed by a data link layer for that fiber. And on this third machine, we will have a data link layer again to manage that and th this machine that we have here may in fact also have two network cards and it may be connected to another machine and that machine will also have a layer two so it's entirely possible that we have a string of these machines in in, in fact uh, some machines may have three four five six seven eight nine however many uh, network cards you want to install in them and then they can send out a message to different machines. In this simplified uh, representation the machines in the middle just have two network interface cards or network cards. So uh, to, to re-emphasize a point that we already made layer 2 here will logically talk to layer 2 there layer 2 there will logically talk to layer 2 there. The Layer 3 gives us the ability to route a message. So suppose that we really want to send a message from this machine to that machine. Then somehow it needs to be routed via these machines in the middle until it gets to the destination machine. So what will happen here? is layer three will somehow include information that says I really want my message to go to that machine on the far right hand side and um, it will then send its message 
down this uh, vertical path to the lower layers, it will eventually get to the physical layer, it will traverse the network, it will go up to layer 3 there. Layer 3 there will say, oh, okay, this is not intended for my machine, this is actually intended for a machine that's far to the right there, so I'm going to send it out via that network interface card. It will then go down, cross that fiber here, come up, it will arrive at the network layer there, layer 3. That will say, ah, oh, that's not for me. It will say, but I can get it there if I send it out to this particular uh, network interface card. And the message will go down physically. It will cross that link, whatever that link is that we have at the bottom. It will go up there. It will arrive at that network layer there, and that network layer will say, ah, oh, that is me, this is its endpoint, I'm not going to route it any further. We've not clearly numbered this layer yet, it's layer 3, and as we've said, at least hinted, this is the network layer. So the network layer is somewhat strange in the sense that it talks to its peer there and then to its peer there and then to its peer at the final destination. One of the problems that one has when one begins to draw these networks is that one tends to run out of space. So what I'm just quickly going to do here is to say let's take that out and for the sake of simplicity we're going to say that this is the destination machine. So we are assuming now that the network packet that's been sent out has gone up to the machine in the middle, gone down again, and then gone up, and that is the, its eventual destination. Layer 4 says, let's try and forget everything about all this network infrastructure. What we want is a pipe between two processes. So on layer 4, if this is layer 4 on this machine, layer 4 does not want to know anything about the intermediate nodes. It only wants to know about the destination node. Layer 4, therefore, provides you with process-to-process -process communication. It's peer is not some intermediate node, its peer is at the destination node, at the other node that uh, participates in this conversation. Yet again, the message will be sent down in the real world, down to the physical layer, up to layer 3 there and down again, and then at this end it will be sent up to layer 4. The name of layer 4 this is the layer that provides you with this end-to-end -end pipe, process-to-process -process communication, is the transport layer. Now, this will be true for all the layers above layer 4. They're going to talk from endpoint to endpoint. They're not going to care about these intermediate nodes at all. So I know I don't even have to think about these nodes anymore. Of course, I can at some point want to send something to this computer. But for this conversation that's going on at the moment, these ones in the middle will no longer be involved in any of our communication. Layer 5 is the so-called session layer. The session layer is responsible for controlling sessions. In other words, it is in charge of what happens when, who is allowed to send messages when. Another way of formulating this is to say it is in control of the conversation or stated differently, dialogue control is what it does. As is the case for our other examples, the message will be sent down physically, then travel all around the network, up via this middle one to layer 3 down again, and then up at the destination layer, 
where it will reach the session layer or layer 5 on that machine. Same that we've had for the previous examples. This is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, situation. So whatever this session layer says, it says to the session layer, it's actually quite hard to properly talk about the session layer because in modern networks, there's hardly anything that looks like the session layer. So we keep it in for the sake of for completeness, but it is hard to give proper illustrations of what it does. Layer 6 is the presentation layer. So layer 6 deals with the way in which information is presented. Also stated slightly differently, the way in which information is represented. A uh, high-level example of that may be the order in which a date is written. If uh, you write a date 1 slash 4 slash whatever the year is, then in our part of the world it will be the 1st of April. But in the USA that would be the 4th of January. So a date where the month appears first and a d date where the day appears first is something that changes on an international level and therefore we may want to represent that date differently. But we will have a lot more to say about data representation when the time comes along. Uh, the point is that uh, whatever data is to be encoded is somehow encoded on layer 6 here. It travels around the network just as we've had with the other cases. Here it moves up to our layer 6 uh, peer layer there. And whatever this layer said should be encoded is interpreted by the presentation layer at that end. And then finally we get to layer 7. Layer 7 is the application layer. The application layer is the reason why we have this network in the first place. We may want to send email and therefore application may be email or we may browse the web and therefore the application layer will be web traffic. I have to be a bit more formal here if we are talking about web traffic then we are not talking about everything that a browser can do. We are talking about something like the HTTP protocol. Also, when we want to send email, we're not necessarily talking about sending and receiving email. We may be talking about something like SMTP, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, which we will encounter again soon to send mail. Or something like the POP3 protocol, which we will also encounter again soon, which is used to retrieve email. Those are different uh, application layer protocols. But whatever our application is, whether it is retrieving a web page from a web server, or whether it is sending out an email, or whether it is fetching an email from a server, all of those are examples of application layer protocols. So layer 7, the application layer, Application layer, just like all the previous layers, will really send its message down the network. It will traverse the network, will uh, go up the other end, and it will talk to the application layer, layer 7, at the destination machine. To make matters a bit more concrete, if our application layer is something like HTTP, then our web browser may be sending out a GET message and the GET message will be understood by the web server on that end. So again, peer-to-peer -peer communication, layer 7 to layer 7 communication and the response will also come back as an HTTP response. But the actual flow of the message will be down through this middle machine, through as many machines as we may have in the middle, until it gets to the destination where it will move up and be interpreted by that server. So logically, peer-to-peer, -peer, physically, down all the layers of the stack, up and down 
the machines in the middle that act as routers, really, and then up at, through all the layers at the destination machine until it reaches the application layer, which then actually interprets the message and responds, and the response will then traverse the network in the opposite direction. In summary, we have seven layers. Let's talk about them again, starting at the top. The application layer depends heavily on the application, on the reason why we are running this network in the very first place. It may be that we want to send email, it may be that we want to manage the network, it may be that we want to browse the web, it doesn't matter. That's the sort of application that we are talking about. We are not really talking about the application in the sense of it being a piece of software. We are talking about the language, the protocol that is used by this application to interface to the network stack. Layer 7, the application layer, provides the functionality that is required. Layer 6, the presentation layer. This layer deals with the presentation or very often the representation of information. Information needs to be represented because it may have to be encoded in some form that can be uh, sent via the network. It may be because of different notations that are used on different parts of the globe or we may simply want to be very clear what notation we are using to write this uh, message in. For example, there is a major difference between ASCII and Unicode. Even though ASCII is the same as Unicode uh, in terms of the first 128 characters, we still may want to say, hang on, what we are doing here is we are using Unicode in a UTF-8 representation. So that's the sort of thing. How do we present or represent information on this network? This is very, very narrowly integrated with the application layer because if the application is something that deals with graphics, then it doesn't make sense to say we're going to represent this in terms of ASCII characters or that sort of thing. It will be uh, some form of compression format or something that we will have to use. It depends on the application layer. So this is layer 6, the presentation layer. Layer 5, the session layer. This is the layer that says what happens when. And this is the one that gives us headaches to talk about because it is extremely hard to find good examples of how it is used. Uh, again, if we think about specific applications, then you may have to log in in an application before you are allowed to use any of the functionality. Think about some bank application where you're going to withdraw money. You may have to supply your bank card and your PIN before the bank's main computer will let the ATM know that it can dispense the cash. There is this uh, convention, this rules of who talks when. First, the ATM sends a message to the bank's main computer to tell the main computer that someone inserted a card into the ATM. Then the ATM gets a message from the main computer to ask for the user's PIN number and so on. And there are, of course, many varieties uh, of these possibilities. Nowadays, we have cordless withdrawals and that sort of thing that makes life very different. So what we will see is that if you look at a simple protocol like, let's say, uh, the SMTP protocol, then sending an email happens only once you have identified yourself. Even more importantly, if you look at something like POP3, where you're going to retrieve an email, there you have to supply a password, definitely. And before you've supplied that, that password, there's no way in which you can retrieve an email. So uh, in, in terms of that simple SMTP or POP3 protocol, there is a sequence of events, and many people will see that sequence as the session layer. And what you will find is that often layers 7, 6, and 5 are 
treated as a single layer. Uh, especially if you look at the TCP protocols or the TCP IP protocols, then you will see that the application protocols really include all the information about representation and about the dialogue that is to occur. I said always, no, sometimes the representation is indeed specified in a different standard, but I've seen very few where the session is specified in a different standard. So, layer 5, the session layer. These uppermost three layers, because they are so closely tied to the application, are often referred to as the application-oriented layers. The next layer is layer 4, the transport layer. The transport layer provides you with a pipe between two communicating processes. It is agnostic in terms of the applications that are being run on it, but it is also agnostic in terms of the routing that occurs below it. So it is independent from the application, and it's also independent from the network. Its role is to abstract away everything above it, if you're looking at the network below it, or to abstract everything below it if you are looking at the application. So the application-oriented layers can simply assume that there is a pipe and the network-oriented layers, which by the way is what we will call the bottom three layers, simply have to provide a pipe. And there is a nice clean separation of duties. Layer 3, the network layer, performs routing. So whenever you hear about layer 3, your thoughts immediately jump to routing. When you hear about routing, your thoughts immediately jump to layer 3. It's important to realize that very often the type of routing that we are talking about here is really forwarding. So you may have a routing algorithm that determines the best route in a network, and that may actually be an application. So you may actually have something on layer 7 that determines routes, but once the routing tables have been completed, then it becomes a matter of simply forwarding a packet from one node to the next. This is not always the case. Sometimes you have somewhat more intelligent layer 3 nodes, but the vast majority of layer 3 nodes that we will encounter are nodes that will simply do some sort of a lookup in a table and determine where the next hop is. And they will then forward the packet to the next hop. And the moment when they realize that the next hop is either the machine itself or somewhere just on that network directly connected to it, it will simply just deliver it. Uh, there won't be any forwarding. So uh, when we talk about the routing here, we are talking about the implementation of a route that has been determined by something that is more intelligent. The data link layer, layer 2, provides one with control over the link between two machines. So in any network path, we will have a various paths in, in the vast majority of cases. Sometimes we will have machines that are directly connected, but in general your machine will be connected to uh, something in the middle and that will be connected to, to a further machine and that will be connected to yet another machine and so on until you have a computer that is finally connected to your destination machine. Now, all these links have to be controlled. They have to be controlled in three ways. The one way in which they have to be controlled is in terms of data delineation. On this physical layer, that is the next one we will talk about, on the physical layer you will have uh, sequences of bits and they may be spurious bits caused by lightning if we talk about copper or they may be introduced by uh, lightning and other electrical facilities if we are talking about uh, waves, electromagnetic waves, uh, so wireless communications or even in optical fiber it's possible that they are somehow introduced although that really happens but still you have to be able to say this is the start of a packet and this is the end of a packet and you need data delineation. 
So this is the first of the functions of this data link layer. The second function of the data link layer is media access control. If you have two computers that are connected to this piece of common copper wire, then uh, they can't talk at the same time. Yes, sometimes you do uh, provide full duplex communications, and then they can talk at the same time. But if it's uh, not full duplex, which is very often the case, then there's only one machine that is allowed to talk at a given time, and who talks when is the question. And the, the, the big word that we use for that is contention control, or sometimes we also refer to it as media access control. You will find that often we take a piece of copper cable and we connect a couple of machines to that single piece of copper cable. And obviously that worsens the problem. If you have 20 machines that are connected to the same piece of copper cable, then the question becomes who is allowed to speak next? And that is yet another example of contention control or media access control. Think about something like Wi-Fi. We are sharing the same airways all around us. Again, who is allowed to speak when? Layer 2 will sort that out for you, contention control. Also on Layer 2, we tend to talk about error control as one of its core functions. In truth, all layers are dealing with error control. If you think about the application layer, then on the application layer, you are familiar with uh, errors such as an email that could not uh, be delivered, perhaps because someone used a non-existent email address. Or on the web, uh, if you get an error 404, where the page doesn't exist. And those errors may be transient in the sense that there is no connection right now, so we can't deliver it. Or they may be permanent in terms that that email address really doesn't exist anymore or that that web page doesn't exist anymore. doesn't matter. The point is that on the application layer, we do have problems and we also have problems on all the other layers. So as we go down the protocol stack, we will talk about errors but as a reminder, perhaps because it's such a, a common place for errors to occur, is where we transmit them. And therefore, we will include error control as a very specific category of problems that need to be solved on the data link layer. So the data link layer, layer 2, connects two machines, its prime functions are contention control or media access control, data delineation, and error control. And now we can finally move down to layer one, the physical layer. The physical layer is the layer where information will be physically transmitted from one machine to the next. So in this physical transmission from one machine to the next, as we've said on a couple of times, we may use copper cable, we may use optical fiber, Obviously, uh, this layer goes well beyond that. We need to talk about voltages, for example, to represent data. Are we going to use two voltages, zero volts and five volts, or minus 12 volts and plus 15 volts to represent two binary values? Or are we going to use more voltage levels so that we can use a single transmission of an electrical signal to transmit more than a single bit of information? All in all, the physical layer may become extremely complex. Again, think of wireless transmissions in things like Wi-Fi and so on. And even if you are really interested in it, the extent to which the number of antennas have grown, the number of frequencies that are being used have grown and so on for wireless communications. However, that is a topic that is really an engineering topic and we won't say much about that. Physical layer, layer one, it provides you with a physical connection between two adjacent nodes. Now, for the reasons that we've just described, and as we've already said, the bottom three layers are typically referred to as the network-oriented layers. So we have our application-oriented layers, five, six, and seven, we have our network-oriented layers, 1, 2, and 3, and we have our layer that provides us with the abstract connection or uh, the abstract uh, bridge. Or 
and we have our layer that provides us with the abstract functionality that we expect from the bottom three layers or that is provided by the top three layers. And we have our abstract layer that sort of forms the glue between these two types of. And we have layer four, which is an abstract uh, form of glue almost between our network oriented layers and our application oriented layers. As I've said before, I am going to use uh, terms like layer 3 and then you have to be able to say networking. I have, will be talking about uh, presentation and then you have to say that's layer 6. But some of the other keywords that have come from this discussion, such as routing, should take you immediately to the network layer, to layer 3. Or when we talk about a pipe between two processes where you immediately have to say, ah, oh, that's the transport layer, that is layer 4. So that was your first introduction to the ISO OSI model. We will revisit it because it is such an important part of the course. In fact, the way in which we are going to deal with the course is to traverse the layers from the highest layer to the lowest layer. So when we get into the meat of the course, we will talk about layer 7 and then layer 6 and then layer 5 and so on. Most textbooks, most courses in fact, if you look at them, tend to do the converge. They f will follow the sequence from the bottom upwards. But our perspective as computer scientists is usually, or our focus as computer scientists is usually on the upper layers. That's where the application resides. Those are the things that we deal with. The lower levels are more closely tied to engineering and is something that we tend to use, but not something that we tend to have any impact on. However, before we start with this meat, that as I've just said, we'll start with layer 7, we're going to go through these seven layers in another video to make sure that all of this makes sense.